Audiobook provided by TaughtToProfit.com. I'm Frank Betcher. The album you're about to hear is not a scientific analysis of sales psychology. It's simply the story of my professional life, the strikeouts, the errors, the failures, and how I replace them with success, happiness, and financial security. But before you listen to it, I want to say something to you personally. If you were my own brother, I would say to you what I'm going to say to you now. You haven't got much more time. I don't know how old you are, but let's assume, for example, that you're about 35. It's later than you think. It won't be long before you're 40. And once you pass 40, time goes so fast, you can hardly believe it. I know. I'm far on the other side of the half century mark myself, and I just can't believe it. Time goes so fast. Now that you're ready to listen to this recording, I think I know how you must feel. You're naturally curious, perhaps a little bit skeptical. You're not sure whether this is going to help you or not. Well, I can tell you right now that when you have finished listening to the entire album, one of three things will happen. First, nothing. If you do nothing about it, listening to my story and the principles it contains will be a total waste of your time. Second, you can say to yourself, well, he's got a lot of good ideas here. I'll give him a trial. If this is your reaction, I prophesy failure. Third, you can take the advice of one of the greatest minds ever produced, Benjamin Franklin. If he were alive today, he would tell you to select your own personal success plan based on the successful experience of others, and then follow that plan religiously one step at a time. I don't know whether you're a printer, a salesman, a banker, or a pushcart peddler. It really doesn't make any difference. Listen to what happened to me. Then select 13 of the principles I have put to use in my work and my life and apply them to yourself. If you concentrate on one principle at a time, apply it to your work for one week, then use another one for the second week, by concentrating on one at a time, you will get farther with it in one week than you otherwise would in a year. A new confidence will take hold of you. At the end of 13 weeks, I know you will be surprised with your progress. By the time you repeat the second 13 weeks, everybody will see in you a greatly different person. Like so many young fellows who later became successful in the business world, I didn't start out as a salesman. I was a professional baseball player. I had played on teams in some of the minor leagues, and because I loved what I was doing, I generated a lot of enthusiasm. Consequently, few years, I moved up to the majors, third baseman for the St. Louis Cardinals. As I said before, I was several years younger in those days, loaded with enthusiasm about baseball, and able to tell my own story in my own way. Then one day in the early spring, we were playing the Chicago Cubs at the old ballpark in Chicago. The Cubs had one man on in the first inning when part of their powerhouse, a big slugging outfielder, came to bat. He connected with the first pitch. But it was a swinging bunt rolling down the third baseline. It caught us by surprise. I grabbed the ball on the run and with the same motion, turned to fire it over to first. <laughs> That's when it happened. It felt as though my arm came out of the socket in my shoulder. Later that evening, I couldn't lift my arm to eat dinner with it. I waited for the doctor's opinion. I'm sorry to keep you waiting, Frank. I picked up your x-rays at the lab. Here they are. I never could make sense out of those fuzzy pictures, Doc. What do they mean? Mm, no bone damage but a severely torn muscle and a badly inflamed tendon. Well, it could be worse. Better than two broken legs. I don't know, Frank. I honestly don't. What kind of answer is that? Time is the best answer. I've treated hundreds of baseball injuries similar to yours. With proper rest, some of them healed themselves. With others, it was no more baseball forever. <laughs> Thank you.
Young Man on His Way Down. Have you ever heard of a man being haunted by an echo? Well, it happened to me. Six months went by. My sore arm seemed to be improving, yet I still couldn't throw a baseball with any power behind it. That was bad enough, but the worst part was, every time I tried and failed, I could hear the echo of that Chicago doctor's voice. With others, it was no more baseball forever. I guess the manager of the Cardinals must have heard the same echo. At the beginning of the next season, I was traded to Montreal. It was mighty cold in Canada, especially for a ball player with a glass arm. They put me out in right field. When a ball came out there, the second baseman raced out to me to relay the ball back to the infield. That's exactly what happened. The only catch was I had to snap the ball to him underhand. I tried. <laughs> tried as I could. And then came the echo. With others, it was no more baseball forever. The next day, the president of the club put it to me straight. Uh, Frank... And we don't believe your arm will ever get any better in this cool climate. I, I talked to St. Louis last night and talked it over with them. They've decided to send you to Chattanooga, Tennessee in the Southern League. Here's your train ticket. It's a check. Pays you up to date. So I took my glass arm and went to New Orleans, where the Chattanooga club was playing for a few days. At least I knew someone on the team. Gabby Street, the catcher, who a few years later became manager of the St. Louis Cardinals. But Gabby couldn't change the inevitable. The only difference was that this time, it came in the form of a typewritten letter. I picked it up at the hotel desk, read it, then went up to the room Gabby and I shared. Betch, what's wrong? You look like you've been hit over the head with a baseball bat. Hit with a ball club, you mean? Uh, I don't get it. Here. Read this. Mr. Frank Betcher, dear sir, this is to notify you of your unconditional release by the St. Louis National League Baseball Club and the Chattanooga Baseball Club, effective immediately. Enclosed fine check covering salary to date, yours truly. I oh. just haven't got brains enough to listen to an echo, that's all. Oh, Frank, Frank, don't talk crazy. This is terrible, but it's not the end of the world. I've got a lot of friends, managers, in baseball. I'll send off some telegrams and find a spot for you. Gabby did spend quite a bit on wires to managers all over the country, but only one of them replied. Galveston, in the Texas League. And I don't think I've ever been as blue as I was that night when Gabby walked with me to the railroad station. Don't look so glum, Frank. The Texas League isn't Siberia. You'll be back in the majors again. Yeah, maybe. Oh, boy! Sure you will, Batch. With others... It was no more baseball forever. Ah, oh, shut up. Shut up, I tell you. Frank, what are you sore at me for? I didn't say I, that. I, it's not you, Gabby. I wasn't talking to you. It's just that... Oh, what's the use? You gotta go now. I'll be seeing you. Yeah. So long, Frank. Well, I don't have to tell you what happened in Galveston. A third baseman who can't throw a ball isn't much good to a ball team. I got my walking papers. Not that anybody was mad. The manager even kidded me about it. <laughs> Betcher, you've established new all-time record in baseball. You've gone from the major leagues to Class AA, Class A to Class B, all in one season. He was absolutely right. Talk about going downhill in a hurry. I made a bobsled driver look like he was standing still. So I decided that as long as I was slipping, I might as well slip all the way. I wired a Class D ball club in the Carolina League. A week later, I walked up to the plate in a little ballpark in Raleigh, North Carolina. It was my first time at bat, so I swung hard. I missed the ball, but it didn't miss me. It caught me just above the wrist on my bad arm and broke the bone. That was when I heard the echo for the last time. With others, it was no more baseball forever. And I finally had to admit the truth. This was the finish. I was sick, broke, out of work, and no chance of ever coming back. I was a complete failure. The Rookie Salesman My broken arm healed soon enough, but my career as a professional baseball player was definitely all in the past tense. 
I found myself back home in Philadelphia without the slightest idea of how I could earn a living. With no formal education or particular skill, a job was pretty hard to come by. But I kept on looking and finally landed one. Installment collector for a company that sold furniture on credit. That's what I was doing when one day I met an old friend who couldn't understand why Frank Betcher, the ball player with such a brilliant future, was riding a bicycle on a collection route. When I explained the situation, he suggested that I see a man he knew, the local manager of the Fidelity Mutual Life Insurance Company. The following morning, I was in that man's office. I'm pleased to know you, Mr. Betcher. Our mutual friend has recommended you very highly. Well, that's mighty nice of him. Ever had any sales experience? No. No, I haven't. You see, up until two years ago, I played professional baseball, and I... Yes, uh, so I understand. However, I don't think lack of experience should be uh, too much of a handicap. Here, uh, here's our rate book, and also quite a bit of literature which explains the company's policies and services. Study them over and map out your own sales plan. We'll give the arrangement a trial for a few months. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Of course, you'll have desk space here in the office, and I'll set up a drawing account against your commissions. Thanks again. That's the best news I've heard this year. Soon after I started, I established a record that was the amazement of the insurance world. No one in the office could understand how it was possible for anyone to make as many calls as they thought I made and not sell anything. I can't figure it out, Betcher. You've been representing this firm several months. You haven't made a single sale. Yes, I know. According to your sales report, you've called on enough prospects. What's the matter? Now, you have made this many calls, haven't you? Well, no. I mean, not exactly. You see, I'm not a very good talker, and when a prospect tells me he's busy or something like that, I, I just leave, that's all. And then I... I'm sorry, Frank, because I like you very much, personally. I guess you just weren't cut out to be a salesman. I think we'd better terminate our trial agreement as of today. Yes, sir. I'm sorry it didn't work out. Now, if you have any personal property on your desk, you can pick it up at any time. We'll always be glad to see you. That was it. I had struck out again. I spent a couple of days feeling sorry for myself, and then I began to think about why I had failed as a salesman. I decided that one of the reasons was because I couldn't talk very well. I was always at a loss for words. I had heard about a night course in public speaking at the YMCA, so the next evening I went down there. Good evening and welcome. I don't think I've seen you here before. No, you haven't. I'm Frank Betcher. I'm looking for the class in public speaking. Good. I'm Dale Carnegie, and you've come to the right place. Do you want to enroll? I... I sure do. When do I start? Right now. We've just started work in extemporaneous speaking. Everyone in the class has been taking turns. You're our next speaker. No, no, Mr. Carnegie. I couldn't. I... I can't even... Nonsense. Gentlemen, we have a new class member who's going to talk to us on any subject he chooses. All right, Mr. Betcher. Well, I, I guess the only thing I know to talk about is baseball. Like I told Mr. Carnegie here, I'm not used to this kind of thing. And... Excuse me, Frank. Let me interrupt for a minute. You just mentioned something about baseball. But from your tone of voice, it must be the dullest game in the world. Is it? No, anything but dull. All right, then let's have some enthusiasm. Remember this, all of you. This is a cardinal rule in public speaking. Be enthusiastic about your subject. If you're not enthusiastic, how can you expect any enthusiasm or interest from your listeners? All right, Frank, start over again and remember what I said. I didn't know it then, but that night was one of the most important turning points in my life. Within a month, and with Dale Carnegie coaching me, I lost every bit of my fear about speaking in public to one person or fifty. The principal thing I learned was that enthusiasm is contagious. If you act and talk enthusiastically, you'll project that quality, and your listeners will react in the same way. Now, for the first time in two years, I knew where I was going. A new Frank Betcher. 
I don't know how Columbus or Magellan or any of the other great explorers felt when they realized they'd discovered something new, but I do know how I felt when I discovered the new Frank Betcher, who had been hiding right under the skin of a discouraged ball player. A few days later, when I went back to the office of the insurance company, I didn't have any definite plan in mind. I just wanted to talk to someone, anyone. And the manager had told me to drop in any time to pick up the personal stuff I'd left in my desk. I was a little bit surprised when I walked into the big sales office and found it deserted. Not a person in sight. Then I realized that everyone must be in the conference room for a sales meeting. I didn't want to barge in there without being invited, but I could open one of the doors at the back of the room and listen. Although I didn't know him, I recognized the voice of the man who was talking. It was Mr. Walter Lamar Talbot, president of the company. I heard Mr. Talbot utter one sentence that has had a profound and lasting effect on my life for the past 43 years. That one sentence was this. Gentlemen, after all, this business of selling narrows down to one thing, just one thing, seeing the people. Show me any man of ordinary ability who will go out and earnestly tell his story to four or five people every day, and I will show you a man who just can't help making good. That was the new Frank Betcher's second revelation. Mr. Talbot's words hit me like I'd been beamed with a baseball. Seeing the people, that was it. A few minutes later, I was in the manager's office. Mr. Collings. Well, we haven't seen you in some time, Butcher. What you been doing? Mr. Collings, I've got an idea. Will you give me another chance? Hmm? Well, uh... <laughs> All right, Butcher. I'll put you back on a drawing account for 30 days. Will that be long enough to prove your idea? It won't take that long. The next morning, the new Frank Betcher made his first call. And I doubt that my prospective customer had ever seen such a display of enthusiasm before or since. Naturally, the first thing he told me was that he wasn't interested in insurance. Three months before, a statement like that and I would have folded up. Now, all I did was increase my enthusiasm. As I look back on that interview, I can hardly believe some of the things I said and did. I paced the floor. I pounded on his desk. At one point, I fixed him with a cold stare and said, Mr. Emmons, someday you're going to have an old man on your hands, and that old man is going to be you. The time to start throwing forward passes to him is right now. As I threw the forward pass, he ducked. Every minute I expected him to stop me and ask me if anything was wrong. But he never did stop me except to ask questions. Did he throw me out? No, he bought. His next move was to pull out his checkbook and say, How much will the first year's premium be? You can imagine how I felt. With his check in my pocket, I didn't walk back to the insurance company office. I floated on air. The commission on that sale was enough to cover my advance for the entire 30 days Mr. Collings had allotted me. When I handed the check to Mr. Collings, he was almost excited as I was. He asked how I did it, and when I told him, he said, I want you to repeat that sale word for word at our agency meeting tomorrow morning. Meet Benjamin Franklin. No other event in my life can compare with the illuminating thrill I experienced the first time I read the autobiography of Benjamin Franklin. Dale Carnegie suggested that I read it, so I borrowed a copy from the Philadelphia YMCA. Later, I was able to buy an edition in a much finer binding. And even today, many, many years later, I still consider it the most important book in my library. Had I encountered Franklin's personal story at an earlier age, it might not have created such a deep impression on me. But up to this time, the only thing I knew concerning Benjamin Franklin was the anecdote about him flying a kite in the midst of a big electrical storm. Now, much to my surprise, I learned that he had been confronted with many of the same problems in everyday living that most of us face today. He was in debt. His printing business wasn't going well. He was worried about his health and concerned with his own inability to get along with people. Franklin believed that all of his problems could be solved if only he could acquire the essential principles of successful living. He knew what the principles were, 
so he devised a method of assimilating them. The method proved to be so simple, yet so practical, that anyone could use it. Being a practical man and a scientist, his first step was to choose 13 principles which he felt were necessary or desirable for him to acquire and try to master. Then he devoted a week's concentrated attention to each principle successively. In this way, he was able to go through his entire list in 13 weeks and repeat the process four times each year. Benjamin Franklin continued the practice throughout his lifetime. As I said before, I was tremendously impressed with his unique method of improving himself. I read his list of principles over and over again. I'm sure you're as familiar with them as I am. Temperance, silence, order, resolution, frugality, industry, sincerity, justice, moderation, cleanliness, tranquility, chastity, and humility. When I first read the book, I committed that list to memory because I wanted to use that plan myself, not only to live more successfully, but to improve my selling ability. In order to adapt the principles to my purpose, I chose six of Franklin's 13 principles, then substituted seven others which I thought would be more helpful to me in my business. I'll discuss each subject separately later on, but here is my list as I originally devised them. One, enthusiasm. Two, order, self-organization. Three, think in terms of others' interests. Four, questions. Five, key issue. Six, silence, develop the listening habit. Seven, sincerity, deserve confidence. Eight, knowledge of my business. Nine, appreciation and praise. Ten, Smile, it creates happiness. 11. Remember names and faces. 12. Service and prospecting. And 13. Closing the sale, action. As a further extension of the plan, I made up a set of 3 by 5 cards, 13 of them. Each card carried a headline and a brief summary of the subject or principle it represented. I called them Pocket Reminders, the name they're still known by. The first week I put my plan into action, I carried the card on enthusiasm in my pocket. At odd moments throughout that week, I would read and reread it. The second week I carried another card, and so on for each week of the 13-week cycle. Then I started all over again. I found that each week I was getting a better hold on myself, gaining a clearer understanding of the subject. Consequently, the business of selling became more interesting and profitable. At the end of one year, I had completed four courses. I found myself doing things naturally and unconsciously that I wouldn't have dared to attempt the year before. Although I fell far short of completely mastering any of the principles, I was definitely improving, and I have continued to improve every year since that time. It's a simple plan, but a truly magic formula for increasing sales. I doubt seriously whether I could have maintained my enthusiasm without it, and maintained enthusiasm will produce miracles. Organize yourself. Following the first subject, enthusiasm, the second principle in the Betcher Successful Selling version of Ben Franklin's plan is order, self-organization. I don't know of any subject that's more important to a successful salesman. Without order, which means keeping careful records of all your activities, every prospect you contact, every sale you make, every referral you receive, you can't possibly know whether you're making money or losing it. The first year I sold life insurance, the same principle will apply to selling any other product or service, my records proved invaluable. At the end of that year, the calls I had made totaled 1,849. Out of these calls, I had interviewed 828 people, closed 65 sales, and my commissions amounted to $4,251.82. Each call was worth $2.30. Think of it. One year previously, I had been fired. Now, every call I made, regardless of whether I saw the man or not, put $2.30 down in my pocket. I never could find words to express the courage and faith these records gave me. The records also showed that 70% of my sales were made on the first interview, 23% on the second, and 7% on the third and subsequent callbacks. 
But listen to this. 50% of my time was spent going after the 7%. My immediate reaction to that was, why bother with the 7%? Why not put all of my time on the first and second interviews? With this decision alone, I increased the value of each of my calls from $2.30 to $4.27. Without records, I would have had no way of discovering these facts. Another valuable lesson I learned through my records was the realization that I was probably the worst self-organizer in the world. I had set a goal of 2,000 calls for the year at the rate of 40 per week. But before I knew it, I was so hopelessly behind that schedule, I was ashamed to put down any records. I kept making new resolutions, but they never lasted very long. I just couldn't get organized. Finally, I got it through my head that I must take more time for planning. It was easy to throw 40 or 50 prospect cards together and think I was prepared. That didn't take much time. But to go back over my records, plan exactly what I would say to each prospect, prepare proposals, write letters, and then make out a schedule from Monday through Friday in their proper order, required four or five solid hours of the most intensive kind of work. The only solution was to set aside each Saturday morning and call it Self-Organization Day. Did it work? It made all the difference in the world. I no longer had to drive myself to make calls. I walked in to see men with confidence and enthusiasm. It's surprising how much you can get done when you take time enough to plan it and how little you accomplish without a plan. If you're one of the kind who says, Oh, that wouldn't work with me. I can't live on a schedule. I wouldn't be happy. Well, whether you know it or not, you're already living on a schedule. And if it's not planned, it's probably a poor one. Let me give you an example. Not long ago, a friend of mine came to me for advice. He was badly discouraged in his sales job. Mr. Betcher, tell me something, frankly. D do you think I'm cut out to be a salesman? If you put it that way, Charlie, no. I don't think you're cut out to be a salesman. Oh, you don't? I don't think anybody's cut out to be a salesman or anything else. I think we've got to cut ourselves out to be whatever we want to be. Well, I know what my trouble is. There just isn't enough time. I, I can't get organized, that's all. Can't get organized. Charlie, why don't you join the 6 o'clock club? The what? It's another of Benjamin Franklin's ideas. Start setting your alarm clock for 6 o'clock every morning instead of 7.30. It gives you an extra hour and a half to plan your day. I've been doing it for years. An extra hour and a half every day. Hey, that's a good idea, Mr. Betcher. I'm going to try it. And I'm going to set aside Saturday morning for self-organization day. Charlie's had two promotions since he and I had that talk. He's now one of the youngest sales managers in the history of a large food packing firm. If you want to enjoy one of the greatest luxuries in life, the luxury of having enough time, time to play, time to rest, and time to think things through, Plan everything you do in the order of its importance. Your life will take on a new zest. You will add years to your life and life to your years. Benjamin Franklin was thinking about order and self-organization when he wrote, Let all your things have their places. Let each part of your business have its time. Think in terms of others' interests. Early in my selling career, I heard Dale Carnegie stress what he termed a fundamental law of successful salesmanship. There is only one way under heaven to get anybody to do anything. Yes, just one way. And that is by making the other person want to do it. Remember, there is no other way. Mr. Carnegie's profound statement must have registered somewhere in my subconscious, but I certainly wasn't aware of it. In fact, about the only thing I was aware of on an August morning less than a year later was Philadelphia's summer heat. I was making a routine call to see Mr. John Scott, owner of a large wholesale grocery firm. In the outer office, one of his sons informed me that his father wasn't available. Dad's pretty busy this morning. W was he expecting you? No, I don't have an appointment, but he requested some information from my company. I've called to give it to him. Well, you've picked the wrong day. Dad's got three men in his office now, and... Oh. 
Dad, here's a man who wants to see you. No appointment, he just dropped in. Uh, Harry, I want you to check this invoice against that New York shipment on the loading dock there. If you do that, you wanted to see me, young man? Mr. Scott, my name's Betcher. You mailed in a card, part of one of my company's advertisements. Your inquiry entitles you to one of our personalized memo books. Here it is. Oh, yes, thank you. Uh, frankly, I'd forgotten about writing for this insurance company, hmm? That's right, Mr. Scott. These little memo books never sell any life insurance for us, but they do get us in and give us an opportunity to tell our story. Well, there are three men in my office, and I'll be tied up for quite a while. But you'd be wasting your time talking insurance to me anyway. I'm 63 years old, stopped buying insurance years ago. My policies are all paid up. My children are all grown. Mr. Scott, a man who's been as successful in life as you are must have some other interests outside of your family or business. I don't know what those interests are, maybe a hospital, religious, missionary, or charitable work. When you're no longer here, would any of those interests lose your support? Through our plan, Mr. Scott, you can absolutely guarantee them support, live or die. Hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, young man, as I said, there are some men in my office right now, but if you'd care to wait a few minutes, I'd like to ask you some questions. I'll be glad to wait. To be truthful, I didn't have the slightest idea what Mr. Scott had in mind, but I knew he must be interested. About 30 minutes later, in his private office, he told me about it. Now, you mentioned your name, but I've forgotten it. Betcher. Frank Betcher. Yes, well, Mr. Betcher, you spoke of charitable work. Now, I support three foreign missionaries in Nicaragua, and I do give away considerable money each year to things that are very close to my heart. I certainly didn't know about it, but I think missionary work, especially in foreign countries, merits all the support it can get. Is there any way insurance could guarantee my continuing support if I should die? Definitely. Well, how much would it cost? Well, of course, I don't know the exact figure you underwrite for these missions, but suppose it's $5,000 per year. If you should die, continuing support under an insurance plan would cost approximately... Well, here are some figures in black and white. Mm. Mm, I see. Well, I had no idea it would cost that much. No, it's too expensive. I, I couldn't consider it. Tell me about those missions, Mr. Scott. I've never been to Nicaragua. I assume you have. Oh, oh, yes. It's a fascinating country. And some of their native customs make a lot more sense than ours do. I spent the next hour listening to Mr. Scott talk about Nicaragua. I enjoyed it because the stories were extremely interesting. But the best part of my visit was when he announced suddenly that he had just decided to buy the insurance plan I'd suggested. He gave me a deposit check right then to put the plan in action. I think I can safely say there wasn't a happier insurance salesman in the city of Philadelphia on that particular August afternoon. Since the sale was made by a green dub like me, it created a mild sensation. A few weeks later, I was invited to tell the story at the annual National Sales Convention in Boston. It was then that Mr. Clayton M. Hunsicker, a nationally known salesman nearly twice my age, told me something that I soon learned was the most profound secret in dealing with people. Mr. Betcher, congratulations on that large sale you made. I wonder if you really understand how you made it. What do you mean? Well, the most profound and important secret of successful salesmanship is find out what the other fellow wants, then help him find the best way to get it. It was the same principle Dale Carnegie had stressed the year before. Here was something more than a sales technique. It was a philosophy to live by. And that's why it's the third principle in the formula for success. Questions. No matter what product or service he's selling, one of the first hurdles a salesman encounters is customer objections. What can he say when the customer objects? I was faced with the same problems a number of years ago, and in my search for expert advice, I bought a book written by a prominent college professor. It was titled, The Art of Overcoming Objections. The professor had obviously done quite a bit of research on the subject. 
and as a result had evolved a series of stock answers to every conceivable objection that even the most stubborn customer could ask. Some of the answers were so clever I committed them to memory. With this help, I felt I was well armed in any battle of wits. I began to put my new knowledge into action with some surprising results. Whenever one of my friends or customers offered an objection to a statement I had made, I would fire back one of these smart answers. It didn't take me long to realize that the author of The Art of Overcoming Objections had never tried to sell anything. And as long as I continued to follow his advice, I wasn't selling anything either. But I was getting involved in a lot of arguments. Fortunately for my career, I threw away the professor's book and replaced it with another one recommended by my old friend Benjamin Franklin. The new author was a man named Plato, who wrote about his teacher Socrates. As you know, more than 23 centuries ago, Socrates established a unique method of teaching and searching for truth. He mistrusted axioms and dogmatic statements. Instead, he imparted knowledge to his students by asking questions. Thus, they discovered the answers themselves. And I discovered, in selling as well as teaching, there is no better way to meet objections than with questions. I probably would never have learned about the Socratic method if Franklin hadn't written about the effect it had on his life. As a struggling young businessman, Ben had trouble getting along with people. He worked long hours, and he applied himself diligently to acquiring new knowledge. But everyone in Philadelphia in those days didn't agree with him, nor did they support some of his ideas. Consequently, he made enemies. One day Franklin was shocked and disturbed when a friend told him that some people were crossing to the other side of the street to avoid meeting him. They didn't like the Franklin habit of abrupt contradictions and argument. Ben decided to change his manners and attitude. He adopted the Socratic method. I have found the same principle equally effective in the business of selling. Instead of making unqualified statements, I ask questions. I also meet objections this way. For example, in closing a sale, one of the toughest objections I've ever encountered is this one. The customer says, I'll have to think it over. I haven't made up my mind whether to take it or not. I generally reply by saying, my job is to help you in making up your mind. You don't have to think it over. And then I draw a line down the middle of a sheet of paper. Across the top of the sheet, I write questions. On one side of the line, I write why. And on the other, why not? This helps people crystallize their thinking. Their answers usually add up to what they really want. They like it this way, and it's their own decision. The Key Issue The late J. Pierpont Morgan, Sr., one of the shrewdest businessmen in all history, once said, A man generally has two reasons for doing a thing, one that sounds good and a real one. The sales records I've kept through the years certainly prove the truth of that statement. In 62% of the cases, the original objection raised against buying was not the reason at all. Only 38% of the time did the prospect give me the real reason behind his objection. Only when a salesman knows the key issue involved can he turn rejections into successful sales. One day a New York friend of mine called to say that a large manufacturer in that city was in the market for $250,000 worth of life insurance. He wanted to know whether I'd be interested in submitting a proposition. The manufacturer's company was borrowing $250,000, and the creditors were insisting on that amount of insurance on the life of the president. About 10 large insurance firms had already submitted elaborate proposals. Naturally, I was interested. My friend arranged an appointment, and the next morning I was on my way to New York. I had given the proposition a lot of thought, and I was able to write down 14 questions that should help this man crystallize his thinking and aid him in making a decision. To strengthen my confidence, I decided to take a long chance. The moment I arrived in the city, I telephoned one of New York's biggest medical examiners and arranged for him to examine my prospective customer at 11.30 that morning. It was then 10 a.m., and 15 minutes later, I was in the private office of Mr. Booth, my prospective customer. Yes, I agreed to see you, Mr. Betcher, as a courtesy to a mutual friend. But I'm afraid you've made the trip from Philadelphia for nothing. Why do you say that, Mr. Booth? Well, as you can see by these presentations on my desk, I've had proposals submitted by all of the leading New York insurance companies. One of them is from a close personal friend. 
He's with New York Life. Well, that's a pretty good company, isn't it? None better in the world. Well, Mr. Betcher, under the circumstances, if you still want to submit a proposition to me, you can make up figures for $250,000 worth of insurance on the ordinary life plan at my age, 46, and mail it to me. But I really think you'd be wasting your time and mine, too. Mr. Booth, if you were my own brother, I would say to you what I am going to say to you now. What's that? Knowing what I do about the insurance business, if you were my own brother, I would tell you to take all those proposals on your desk and throw them into the wastebasket. What? I say that because a true interpretation of all those proposals would require the services of an expert actuary and a lot of time. But even if you were able to select the lowest cost proposition today, five years from today, that very company could be among the highest cost companies. Now, I'm here to help you arrive at a final decision. In order to do that, I must ask you some questions. Is that all right? Sure, sure. Go ahead. As I understand it, your company is to be extended a quarter million dollars in credit, providing your life is insured for that amount and the policies assigned to your creditors. Is that right? Yes, that's the idea. In other words, they have confidence in you, but in the event of your death, they don't have the same confidence in your company. Isn't that right, Mr. Booth? Mm, yes, I suppose you could say that, yes. Then isn't it of paramount importance that you obtain the insurance immediately and transfer that risk to the insurance company? Don't insurance companies deal in risk? Absolutely, and Mr. Booth, I'm in a position to do something for you this morning that no other living person can do. What's that? I have arranged an appointment for you this morning at 11.30 with one of the leading medical examiners in New York City. He's the only medical examiner I know recognized by all life insurance companies whose single examination is good for $250,000 worth of insurance on one person's life. Well, can't any of these other insurance brokers do the same thing for not, me? Not this morning they can't. You would have to contact them. They'd have to make an examining appointment. All that means delay, maybe a week. Why should you take the risk for another week, even another day? Oh, I think I'll live that long. So do I, but postponing the insurance means postponing the loan, and the bankers might change their minds. Isn't that a possibility? Yes, that is a possibility. Mr. Booth, it's now 1110. If we leave here immediately, we can keep that appointment with the examiner. You look like you never felt better in your life. You are feeling well this morning, aren't you, Mr. Booth? <laughs> I'm feeling very well. Good. Then why isn't this examination the most important thing in the world for you to take care of right now? Hmm. hmm. All right. I'll do it. You've made a very wise decision, Mr. Booth. I think so. By the way, uh, Mr. Betcher, whom do you represent? I represent you. I still consider that sale one of the most important ones in my life. A man in another line might say, maybe techniques like that sell insurance, but I'm not in the insurance business. Actually, it makes no difference what you're selling. The same principles apply. Remember them. One, make appointments. When you're expected, you gain a big advantage. Two, be prepared. Know your product or service thoroughly. Three, Ask questions. We've already discussed the power of this technique. Four, the key issue. Analyze your prospect's problem from his point of view. Discuss it in terms of his wants, needs, and desires. The key issue is the key to a successful sale. Silence. The late Charles Steinmetz, electrical genius of the General Electric Company, said, No man becomes a fool until he stops asking questions. Well, unlike Mr. Steinmetz, I became a fool after I began asking questions because I stopped listening. First, my problem was I was afraid to talk. Second, after taking the public speaking course, I discovered that I loved to talk. In fact, I became so proficient at talking that I forgot all about listening. One day, one of my best friends took me aside and kindly told me about this unpardonable fault of mine. Referring to another well-known ear pounder, whom he tactfully assured me was much worse than I, he said, Why, I actually walk five blocks out of my way to avoid him and still save time. He didn't have to give me any other examples. I got the message right away. From that day on, I began to major in the fine art of keeping my mouth shut. I discovered the magic of silence. 
The realization made me think about all the sales I had probably lost, the friends I had bored, and the time I'd wasted. I was so impressed with the importance of learning to be brief that I asked my wife to hold up her finger whenever I got off the beam. I concentrated on asking simple questions and then letting the other fellow talk. Almost immediately, my sales average began to go up. For example, not long after my decision to stay on the quiet side, I called on a business executive who had a reputation for being hard-boiled, particularly about salesmen. His name was Ross. His firm manufactured metal tanks and containers for the chemical industry. I had been referred to Mr. Ross by one of his friends, but that didn't make any difference to him. Uh, come in, come in. Good morning, Mr. Ross. Your secretary said you weren't busy, so I thought... Uh, who are you? My name is Betcher. A friend of yours, Jim Walker, suggested I call on you. Here's his card with a personal notation to uh, you. Is, is that all Walker's got to do? Send people to see me? <laughs> You're a salesman, I suuppose. Yes, I am. Well, whatever you're selling, I don't want any. I'm too busy. I'm not here to sell you anything today, Mr. Ross. I just stopped for a moment to introduce myself and make an appointment for later in the week. Is early morning or late afternoon a better time to see you for about 20 minutes? I told you I am too busy. I, I noticed this metal tank over here on the table. It's an unusual shape. Do you manufacture these? Well, that's a small display model of one of our products, yeah. Hmm, I've never seen anything like it. How long have you been in this business, Mr. Ross? Oh, 23, 20, 40 years. Well, How did you ever happen to get started in this business? Well, that's, uh, that's a long story. Uh, when I was a kid, I went off to work for an outfit in Hoboken, New Jersey. <laughs> Worked my head off for ten years. Wasn't getting anywhere, so I struck out for myself. How'd you happen to locate in this city? Were you born here? Oh, no, no, no. I, I was born in Switzerland. I left home when I was oh, about 14. Lived in Germany for a while, then I came over here to America. Went to night school to learn English. Amazing. And now you own a big manufacturing plant like this. It must have taken a lot of money to start it. Well, started with just uh, $300. <laughs> its present value is more than $300,000. The manufacturing process on those tanks must be very interesting. <laughs> Not with the modern machinery and methods we use. Uh, would you like to see how they're made? I sure would. Well, then, uh, come on. I'll, I'll, I'll show you through the plant. <laughs> For the next hour, all I did was watch and listen. No, I didn't sell Mr. Ross anything that day, nor anything the next time I called. But before a month had passed, he became a valuable customer, principally because I learned how to listen. You can reduce the whole thing to a simple three-point formula. Here it is. One, find out what your prospect or friend is interested in. Two, Try to direct his conversation with questions that he'll enjoy answering. Three, then listen. Nothing else is so flattering or effective as silence. Names and Faces Do you have trouble remembering names and faces? That used to be one of my biggest problems, so I concentrated on improving my memory. I read every book I could find on the subject. Some of them helped me, others only made the problem more confusing. However, I discovered that all the experts agree on three fundamentals of memory improvement. They are, one, impression, two, repetition, three, association. Now, if you have any difficulty remembering these three rules, as I did, just try to remember the first letter of each rule, because when they appear together, they spell a name. I-R-A, Ira. So just remember Ira. Let's examine each of those rules separately. First, impression. Psychologists tell us that most of our memory troubles are in reality faults of observation. I'm sure it was true in my case. I seemed to observe a man's face pretty well, but usually failed completely to get his name. And do you know what I did then? You're right, nothing. I just skipped it, as though the name meant nothing to me. But if the other person failed to pay attention to my name, I felt hurt. If you don't hear a name clearly, it's perfectly proper to say, would you mind repeating your name? It's also proper to make doubly sure by asking, I'm sorry, would you mind spelling it for me, please? 
I've never known of anyone being offended by genuine interest in his name. The principal thing that helped me to remember names and faces was to forget myself and concentrate as hard as possible on the other person, his face, and his name. The second memory rule is repetition. At one time, I would invariably forget a stranger's name within ten seconds after being introduced to him, and occasionally I'm still just as remiss unless I repeat the name several times quickly while it's fresh in my mind. This is a good rule to follow, especially if the name is difficult to pronounce. A friend of mine once had an extremely poor memory, but through study and concentration, he cultivated such a remarkable ability to remember names, faces, and facts that he now makes a hobby of addressing large meetings where he demonstrates his method. In his system, he uses the proper names to form little sentences, stories, or word pictures. Shortly after I heard of this idea, I had an opportunity to try it out on a group of dentists. The chairman, Dr. Matthews, introduced me to Dr. Dolak, Dr. Green, and Dr. Hand. As I shook hands with the doctors, I imagined a scene of pure fantasy in which the disciple St. Matthew had returned to life as a prominent dentist. Dr. Matthews lacked the dough, but Dolak had plenty of the green stuff in his hand. By forming this silly story sentence, it was easy for me to use each doctor's name during the meeting. The real secret of repetition is repetition at intervals. Make a list of people or anything you want to remember and go over it briefly just before you go to sleep at night and again the first thing in the morning. The third rule is association. Association is undoubtedly the most important single factor in memory retention. We all amaze ourselves at times by our ability to recall things that occurred back in our early childhood, things we hadn't thought of since and apparently had forgotten. For instance, recently I drove into a large service station in New Jersey to get some gasoline. The owner of the station recognized me, although it had been more than 40 years since we met. I was embarrassed because I was sure I'd never seen the man before. Then, to help me, he began to use the power of association. I'm Charles Lawson, he said. You and I went to Blaine Grammar School together. My face still registered blank, so he continued. Don't you remember Bill Green or Harry Schmidt? Of course I remember Harry Schmidt, I answered. Harry's one of my best friends. Well, then you must remember when we had the smallpox epidemic, the school closed. A crowd of us went out to the park to play ball. I remember you and I were on the same side. You played shortstop. I played second base. Chuck Lawson, I yelled as I jumped out of the car and grabbed his hand. The power of association had worked like magic. It generally does. I'm surprised at the large number of people who tell me they can't remember names and feel there's nothing they can do about it. Why not make a little secret hobby out of it? In a comparatively short time, you'll find yourself enjoying a far better memory than you ever hoped for. For one week, Carry a small three-by-five-inch card with you, with the following three rules written on it. One, impression. Get a clear impression of his name and face. Two, repetition. Repeat his name at short intervals. Three, association. Associate it with an action picture. If possible, include the person's business. You can remember names and faces, if you make it your business to apply these three rules. The Sale Before the Sale A number of years ago, as I stood on the deck of a large ship, watching it dock at Miami, Florida, I saw something which taught me an important lesson I needed to learn about approaching a prospective customer. At that particular time, selling was the farthest thing from my mind. I was on vacation. As the ship moved closer to the pier, one of the crew heaved something that looked like a baseball with a thin rope attached to it. An attendant standing on the pier stretched his arms wide apart, but let the ball pass over his head, allowing the rope to fall down over one arm. As he pulled in the line hand over hand, I noticed it was dragging a much thicker rope through the water and onto the pier. Soon the attendant was able to curl the heavy rope around an upright iron post the bollard. Gradually the ship was drawn up alongside the pier and made fast to the dock. I asked the ship's captain about this. He said that small rope is called the heaving line. The ball attached to it is called a monkey's fist. 
The heavy rope which fastens the ship to the dock is the hawser. It'd be impossible to throw a heavy hawser far enough over the side of the ship to make connection with the pier. Right there it dawned on me why I had been losing too many promising-looking prospects on my approach. I had been trying to throw them the hawser. For example, just a few days before, a wholesale baker had threatened to throw me out of his office. I had barged in without an appointment and began to deliver a sales talk before he knew who I was, whom I represented, or what I wanted. No wonder he was so discourteous. He had simply returned what I'd given him. After I returned home from that vacation, I began reading everything I could find on the sales approach. I also asked several experienced salesmen about it. I was surprised to hear some of them say the approach is the most difficult step in the sale. It wasn't until then that I began to understand why I frequently got so nervous before my first appointment with a prospect. Obviously, I didn't know how to approach him. I was afraid of being turned down without having an opportunity to tell my story. Where do you suppose I got some of the best advice on how to approach? Not from salesmen. I got it by asking the prospects themselves. Here are two of the principal things I learned from a prospect's point of view. First, they dislike salesmen who keep them in suspense about who they are, whom they represent, and what they want. They resent it violently if a salesman gives a false impression of the nature or purpose of his call. They admire the salesman who are natural, sincere, and honest. Second, if a salesman calls without an appointment, they prefer that he ask whether it's convenient to talk now rather than start right off on a sales talk. There's so little use telling a sales story to a prospect who hasn't first been sold on the importance of listening to you. Use the first ten seconds on every call to purchase the time you need to tell your complete story. Sell the interview before you attempt to sell the product. It's the sale before the sale. In order to achieve its purpose, every successful approach must also consider the prospect's point of view. If you indicate to a businessman that you want to sell him something that will cost him money, you are virtually telling him you want to increase his problems. He is already worrying about how to pay his bills and how to hold down expenses. However, he is anxious to talk with an open mind about any idea that may help him solve that problem. The housewife doesn't have time to talk to a salesman about buying a new refrigerator. She is more concerned with the high cost of meat, butter, and eggs. But she would be vitally interested in any plan or product that will help cut down waste and reduce the cost of food. The approach must have only one objective, selling the sales interview, not your product, your interview. It's the sale before the sale. Service and Prospecting The other day, I tried to figure out how many automobiles I've bought in my time. I was surprised to find that I had bought approximately 37 cars. Now, let me ask you a question. How many different salesmen would you guess sold me those 37 automobiles? Exactly 37. Isn't it amazing? Not one of those salesmen ever once, to my knowledge, made an attempt to get in touch with me again. All of those energetic salesmen who seemed so interested in me before I bought never so much as picked up the phone and called me to find out if everything was all right. As soon as I paid my money and they collected their commission, they seemed suddenly to vanish from the face of the earth. Is that unusual? I don't think so. Countless other people tell me they've had the same experience. Does that prove that selling automobiles is different from other lines of selling? Does it pay the automobile salesman better to forget the customer? and devote all of his time to a search for new buyers? I discovered an outstanding exception to this rule. The sales organization of one of the country's most popular low-priced cars. The company gave its sales force this motto, Never forget a customer. Never let a customer forget you. With this approach, they raised themselves to first place in sales compared with all the other automobile manufacturers in the world. Everybody who buys anything likes courtesy, attention, and service. That's the customer's point of view. But the same attitude also builds greater success and more profits for the salesman. Looking back over my own career of selling, the biggest regret I have is that I didn't spend twice as much time calling on, studying, and servicing my customers' interests. 
It would have paid me infinitely more financially with less nervous strain, less physical effort, and greater happiness. If I had it all to do over again, I'd adopt that automobile company's motto, hang it right over my desk. Never forget a customer. Never let a customer forget you. Some time ago, I put this question to the sales director of one of the country's largest distributors of electric refrigerators. What is your best source of new business? New customers are always enthusiastic and happy about their new purchase, especially if it's a new convenience they're using. Consequently, they're anxious to tell friends and neighbors about it. Our salesmen generally make a courtesy call about a week after one of our products has been installed. They make suggestions and offer help or service. We get the names of more good prospects this way than from any other source. The same sales director told me about the surveys his company has made in various parts of the country. The results are consistently the same. For example, in one Midwestern city, out of 55 new buyers who were questioned, it was found that the salesman had made courtesy calls on only 17. Eight out of the 17 gave the salesman names of prospects whom they called on and sold $1,500 worth of business. Just being courteous immediately produced $1,500 in new business. With that kind of response, suppose all 55 new owners had been followed up promptly. What would have happened? Figure it out. $1,500 divided by 17 calls equals $90 per call. $90 times 55 equals $4,900. Certainly this is more than proof of the old adage, if you take care of your customers, they'll take care of you. In my own business, insurance, I've found referred leads the best possible source of new customers and prospects. Occasionally, men refuse to give me the name of anybody. I encountered a situation like this about a year ago. He was a man who didn't mince any words. I wouldn't send you to see my worst enemy. Why? For the same reason you've never been able to sell me anything. I hate insurance men. All right, let's forget about it. I'll tell you what I'll do. Give me the name of someone you know, under 50, who's making money. I promise I'll never mention your name to him. Okay, if you want to play games, I'll go along. There's a guy named Blair over on Lehigh Avenue. He's about 40 years old and is making lots of money. Manufactures dental supplies. Thanks. I'll call on him. You do that. I drove right over to Mr. Blair's place of business and introduced myself. Who are you and what do you want? My name is Betcher, Mr. Blair. I'm in the life insurance business. A mutual friend directed me here with the understanding that I would never mention his name. Could you spare me five minutes now or would you rather I stop some other time? What do you want to talk to me about? I want to talk about you. Well, if it's insurance, I'm not interested. That's, that's perfectly all right, Mr. Blair. I won't discuss insurance today. But may I have just five minutes? Blair and I became good friends. Within three weeks, I sold him a large amount of insurance. I've never told him how his name became a referred lead, and never once has he asked who sent me. There's no question about referred leads being the best prospects. And prospecting, as a prominent sales executive has described it, is like shaving. If you don't do something about it every day, the first thing you know, you'll be a bum. Hit the bullseye. Looking back through the years, I am astounded how many of the principles I first learned in baseball I was able to apply later on in business and everyday living. For example... Shortly after I joined the St. Louis Cardinals, Jack Bliss, our third-string catcher, broke his leg. That left us with only two catchers. So for a few weeks, I found myself down in the bullpen warming up pitchers. I didn't like this arrangement at all because I wasn't a catcher and I thought I wasn't learning anything down there. But all the time, I was learning a lesson that years later became priceless to me. The best Cardinal pitcher at that time was Slim Sally. I can still hear him yelling at me to hold my glove up. He never would pitch the ball until I held the big catcher's glove up for his target, and he made me shift the target for each pitch. The pocket in the center of the glove was his bullseye. Sal told me that Christy Matheson, one of the greatest pitchers in baseball, had given him the idea. According to Sal, Matheson had said, throwing a ball without a target is like shooting a gun in the air. No gunner ever becomes a sharpshooter without aiming at a bullseye. 
The application of that truth to something other than baseball didn't occur to me until some time later, when I heard a true story about Andrew Carnegie and the president of a university. One of the main buildings of Worcester University had burned to the ground. Two days later, Louis E. Holden, the young president of that institution, went to see Andrew Carnegie. And without wasting any time, he came directly to the point of his visit. Mr. Carnegie, you're a very busy man, and so am I. I won't take more than five minutes of your time. All right, all right. What is it? As you know, the main building of Worcester University has been destroyed by fire. I want you to give us $100,000 to build a new one. Young man, I don't believe in giving money to colleges. But you believe in helping young men, don't you? I am a young man, Mr. Carnegie, and I'm in an awful hole. I've gone into the business of manufacturing college men from raw material. And now the best part of my plant is gone. How would you feel if one of your big steel mills was destroyed right in the busy season? Young man, I'll tell you what I'll do. You raise $100,000 in 30 days, and I'll match it with another 100000 Make the time limit 60 days, and you've got a deal. Done. And don't forget, it's 60 days only. I'll remember. Lewis Holden's interview had taken just about four minutes. Within 50 days, he raised $100,000. And when Andrew Carnegie handed over his check for a like amount, he said, <laughs> Young fellow, if you ever come to see me again, don't stay so long. Your visit cost me just $25,000 a minute. Lewis Holden had shot straight for the bullseye. He knew that one of the softest spots in Carnegie's heart was for ambitious young men. Just recently, I saw a superb demonstration of the wrong and the right way to apply this same rule. I was in a large western city at the time when a man we'll call Brown called on me at my hotel and said, Mr. Betcher, my name is Brown. I'm going to promote a sales school here in the city for young salesmen, and I'm hoping we can get started next month. We're holding a mass meeting here at the hotel tonight. I would very much appreciate it if you'd give us a little talk. It will certainly help me a lot if you'll do it. Now, I didn't know this man Brown. Why should I go out of my way to help him promote his project? Besides, I was getting ready to leave the following day. So I wished him success, but told him I wouldn't be able to do what he asked. Later in the day, however, another man came to see me. We'll call him White. And he was concerned with exactly the same project. But his approach was entirely different. Uh, Mr. Betcher, my name is White, Bill White. Uh, I understand Mr. Brown has already told you about our meeting tonight here at the hotel. Now, I know you're busy, but if there's any way you could possibly arrange to be with us, Mr. Betcher, you could do a lot of good. You know how much this kind of training would have meant to you when you were trying to get started. I don't know of anyone, Mr. Betcher, who could do more good at a meeting like this than you. I'm sure you would have been impressed in much the same way I was with the two different approaches. The first man talked principally about himself his proposition, and what he wanted. The second man never once referred to what he wanted. He shot straight for the bullseye. He appealed to me entirely from my viewpoint. I found it impossible to say no to the second appeal. It's a universal law. When you show a man what he wants, you're hitting the bullseye. He'll move heaven and earth to get it. From Wilkes to me to you. Almost 30 years ago, I learned an amazing sales closing technique from a great salesman named Ernest Wilkes. At the time he discovered his unique method of closing sales, Mr. Wilkes was working for an insurance company in San Francisco, California, collecting 10 and 15 cent weekly premiums from industrial policyholders. As a salesman, he rated low. His small salary and commissions just about fed and clothed his wife and children, leaving nothing for himself. His clothes were shabby and poor-fitting, his coat and shirt sleeves badly frayed. Wilkes' principal difficulty in selling, he told me, was that he'd use every argument he had on the first interview and wind up with the prospect telling him, Leave this information with me and I'll think it over. See me again next week. When I saw him again, Wilkes said, I never knew what to say, because I told him everything in the original interview. Then one day I hit upon an idea. It worked like magic. I began to close every sale when I went back for the second interview. Naturally, I asked for details about the idea, and Wilkes explained it to me. It didn't sound exactly right. 
but I decided to try it with one of my own reluctant customers. Ten days previously, I had presented an insurance coverage plan to a Mr. Ellison, and he told me to leave it with him, that he'd see me in about two weeks. Now it was time for a callback, so I followed Mr. Wilkes' instructions precisely. Here's what happened. First, I wrote up the application in advance, filling in all the information I had, such as full name, business, and home address, and the amount of insurance he said he was considering. Then, I placed a big X on the dotted line where the applicant signs. Wilkes had made an important point of this X. The following day, I called on Mr. Ellison. He was alone in his office, seated at his desk. When I walked in, he tried to signal me that he didn't want to be disturbed, but I ignored his signals and kept on walking toward him. This is one time when a smile is not in order. Finally, he spoke. Oh, Betcher, I've decided to drop that insurance matter. I might take it up again six months from now. As he said this, I deliberately removed the application from my pocket, and when I reached his side, I laid the open application on his desk. Then I spoke the first words Wilkes told me to say. Is that all right, Mr. Ellison? While he glanced at the application, I took my fountain pen out of my pocket, adjusted it for writing, but stood there quietly. I was actually scared. This all seemed wrong. What is this, an application? No. Why, it certainly is. It says application right up here at the top of the page. It won't become an application until you write your name here. As I said that, I handed the open pen to him and touched one finger on the dotted line. He did exactly as Wilk said he would do. Took the pen from my hand without seeming to be conscious of taking it. He read the application slowly. Finally, he rose from his chair and walked to the window. All this time, there was absolute silence. Five minutes must have passed before he returned to the desk, sat down, and began to sign his name with my pen. As he wrote, he sighed, then said, I guess I'd better sign this. It seems like the reasonable thing to do. With the greatest effort to control my voice, I said, Do you want to give me a check for the full year, Mr. Ellison, or would you rather just pay half now and the balance in six months? Uh, how much is it? Only $432. Oh, I might as well pay it all now. If I don't, I'll be just as broke six months from now. Here. Right at that moment, I could hardly keep from yelling at the top of my voice. The miracle clothes that Ernest Wilkes had discovered proved to be the most natural thing in the world. If you ask me for an explanation or the psychology back of that closing technique, I can't answer you. I don't know. Perhaps it's this simple. You keep a man's mind on signing, not on refusing. You finally crowd out all the reasons why he shouldn't, until his mind just keeps subconsciously thinking of all the reasons why he should. And all the thoughts tend to pass into action. Whenever you use this closing technique, remember these four important points. One... Write up the order blank, application, or contract in advance, even though you may only have the prospect's name to put on it. Two, mark a heavy X each place where he is to sign, if a signature is required. Three, your first word should be, Is that all right, Mr. Ellison? This statement is made as you lay the paper directly in front of him. If he is standing up, place the unfolded paper in his hands. Four, the ball is now down on his one-yard line. Momentum is with you. And don't forget, one of the greatest services one man can render another is to help him come to an intelligent decision. Don't be afraid to fail. Do you believe in yourself and the things you want to do? Are you prepared for setbacks and mistakes? Whatever your calling may be, each error, each seeming failure, is like a strikeout. Your greatest asset is the number of strikeouts you've had since your last hit. The greater the number, the nearer you are to your next hit. Why is it, when we read about the great achievements of successful men in sports or business, we are seldom told about their failures? For example, everyone knows about the amazing home run record of the immortal Babe Ruth. But how about another record of his that's rarely mentioned? The Babe slammed a grand total of 829 home runs. But he also struck out more times than any other player in history. He failed to hit 1,330 times. 
1,330 times he suffered the humiliation of walking back to the bench to the sound of jeers and boos. But he never allowed fear of failure to slow him down or weaken his effort. When he struck out, he didn't count that failure. That was effort. If you are discouraged by your apparent failures, listen. Your average may be as good as anybody's. If you don't find your name on the winner's list, don't blame it on your failures. Examine your records. You'll probably discover the real reason is lack of effort. Not enough exposure. You're not giving the law of averages sufficient chance to work for you. I'm always inspired when I study the following record of failures. A young man ran for the legislature in Illinois and was badly swamped. He next entered business, failed, and spent 17 years of his life paying off the debts of a worthless partner. He was engaged to a beautiful young woman, but she died suddenly. Re-entering politics, he ran for Congress and was badly defeated. He then tried to get an appointment to the United States Land Office, but failed. He became a candidate for the United States Senate and was beaten. Two years later, he was defeated again. One failure after another. Bad failures. Great setbacks. But in the face of all this, he kept on trying and became one of the greatest men in all history. His name was Abraham Lincoln. Courage is not the absence of fear, it is the conquest of it. Those words have helped me, given me strength all my life. They're still helping me, and I know they'll help you. This is Frank Betcher speaking. May God bless you, bless you all the days of your life. Audiobook provided by TalkToProfit.com.